But first up... It's our National Buffoon's European Vacation. The Australian Prime Minister has arrived in the UK to begin a weekend of talks as a guest at the G7 Summit in Cornwall. Scott Morrison has just touched down in the UK for the G7 Summit, which is officially underway in Cornwall. Yes, the G7 Summit was on in Cornwall and our Prime Minister Scott Morrison was there on the periphery. Scott Morrison is there as an onlooker. Scott Morrison was there as an observer. Scott Morrison wasn't invited to the royal reception here. There has never been a more important time for Australia to be sitting around the table with the world's leading democracies. Yes, sitting around the table, just not the grown-ups table. We were in fact at the kiddies table, looking up at the uh, big economies, making the big decisions. Okay, keep eating your your vegetables and growing your renewables sector. Maybe you you can sit at the uh, big grown-ups table one day, Australia. In fact, our absence was even noticed by our official head of state, the Queen, who's, who was even like a, where the bloody hell were you to Scott Morrison when they met at Windsor Castle? So you, you, were, you were down there, but I didn't see you and, at, uh, in Cornwall. No, that was, that was just the G7 members. We had to, you were just well, sort of we were an extension <laughs> partner, as they yes. call them. Ha, yes, we're an extension partner. You know that term extension partner? It's also how Charles referred to Camilla for all those years. Anyway, it doesn't. Matter anyway that we were just a on-looking extension partner as Scott Morrison was late. But as you can see, it's a little bit of a foggy mess at the moment and that means that no planes can land at the airport here. So Scott Morrison's flight has been diverted to an airbase just outside Oxford. It means that he and the Australian delegation now face a car trip of about four or five hours down here to the summit venue. As you can see, the weather has not been kind and that has led to Scott Morrison's plane being diverted. Yes, bad weather. In England. Who could have predicted that? Uh, it turns out the uh, delayed landing didn't impact Scott Morrison's plans too much anyway. So he had all of that time on the road. He ended up having to cancel all of his meetings today. So essentially, he's done nothing so far. Aside from stopping off for a pub lunch on his drive down here to Cornwall yesterday, uh, certainly in terms of official engagements, he really hasn't done anything. Yes, but even on the drive to Cornwall, our Prime Minister couldn't avoid controversy. One photo has garnered the worst response, and that's a photo showing Scott Morrison having a pub lunch on his way to the G7. Uh, Australians, have, there's been backlash from Australians calling it tone deaf, Pete, because Australia is still locked in. Yes, our Prime Minister stopped for a pub lunch. How dare he? While everyone in Australia is also stuck here, able to go to the pub for lunch. I, I don't understand the outrage. No, seriously though, Scott Morrison had a four hour drive. What was he supposed to do? Eat a packet of petrol station knickknacks and hobnobs and, and keep driving? Or was our head of government supposed to stop off at a drive through McDonald's? Because I heard he's not legally allowed to set foot in a McDonald's since Engadine. Oh, whoops, sorry, my Engadine McDonald's uh, joke had triggered the lazy satire buzzer there. I apologize. Anyways, onto the G7 itself. And while ScoMo was speeding up the A30, getting Walker's crumbs on his lap, Boris Johnson was welcoming the main players and reminiscing about how bad the coronavirus pandemic was. You've all been going through the most wretched uh, pandemic uh, our countries have faced for our lifetimes, uh, maybe longer, much longer. And I actually think this is a meeting that genuinely needs to happen because we need to make sure that we learn the lessons from the pandemic. We may need to make sure that we don't repeat some of the errors that we doubtless made. Yeah, Boris was like, how bad was that pandemic? Jeez, whew, some countries really stuffed that up. Feel bad for whoever led uh, the United Kingdom last year. Whew, they made some bad mistakes. Oh, oh, was that me? Oops. Also at the G7, the other big topic aside from how bad they stuffed up COVID was, of course, climate change. This summit has made it clear that clean is in and coal is out. There were promises to do more on climate change. The summit resolving to phase out coal-fired power stations and recommitting to zero net greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. World leaders agreeing to stop new government support for coal power by the end of 2021. Yes, finally, the world's biggest economies have decided to stop funding coal. Surely Australia isn't going to be left behind on this one. They're not just going to stand on the sidelines and uh, tell everyone they're wrong like a dodgy dad yelling at a umpire at his 
kids' soccer game. Oh, 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 wait, no, they did. World leaders agreeing to stop new government support for coal power by the end of 2021. Australia has no plans um, or is not pursuing anything that would could be described in that way. But once again, Scott Morrison has refused to commit to that 2050 target for zero net emissions. We're not a signatory to the G7 communique. Yes, everybody in the world is going to be off coal in a few decades, and we're going to keep digging it out of the ground and selling it to absolutely nobody, like an out-of-touch grandpa at a flea market. Yeah, look, kids, it's Titanic on VHS. It's, it's just like watching it on the big screen. You love the big screen. All right, how about, how about Spaghetti Incident on CD then? Everyone loves Spaghetti Incident. And meanwhile, back in Australia, our acting Prime Minister, Nationals Leader Michael McCormack is like, we love coal, we, we're going to have it forever. Australia's Deputy Prime Minister has declared coal will be around for many years to come. He made that prediction after the world's seven biggest economies agreed to phase out government support for coal-fired power stations. 55,000 people are employed in the coal industry and $66 billion of exports that pays for a lot of hospitals, pays for a lot of schools, pays for a lot of barista machines that uh, uh, produces the coffee that uh, inner city types sit around and drink and talk about the, the, the death of coal. What is this coalition government's obsession with having a culture war about coffee? Everybody in Australia loves a decent coffee. Get over it. We're the country that invented McCafe. I was just on a regional tour with a rational fear and every little town had a bloody tr trendy coffee shop now. Who, do, who does he think he's alienating? In fact, Michael McCormack even promotes how good the, the coffee is in the country now when he tries to get people to move there. And uh, there's many, many jobs going in regional Australia at the moment, not just on farms, but in accountancy practices, law firms, uh, Great place. Big enough in which to get a good cup of coffee, small enough to care, Carl. I always say it. Yes, good job, Michael McCormack. Promote those uh, country town coffee shops where people can sit around and talk about how much they hate coal on their way to their coal mining jobs. Good job. Anyways, back to the G7. Of course, the real reason Scott Morrison was there was for some one-on-one -on -one time with his new best buddy, US President Joe Biden. So... How did that go? Tonight, the PM's first meeting with Joe Biden crashed by an unexpected guest on the sidelines of the G7 summit. Unusually, an anticipated bilateral meeting with the US president turned into a three-man affair. We do know that Scott Morrison wanted a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Joe Biden. He hasn't managed to get that at this G7 summit. Instead, Boris Johnson was joining in, and this is how Scott Morrison is selling it. I would say it was, a, it was a meeting of great friends and allies. Oh, don't you hate that? It's a bit like if you're in high school and you finally build up the courage to ask a girl out on a date to the movies and she agrees and you're over the moon. But when you get there, she's brought along your, your friend Billy, who's from another school. Ugh. And then on Monday, you try and spin it positively at school and you say this. I would say it was, a, it was a meeting of great friends and allies. And if that wasn't enough, after the G7, Scott Morrison has to hang out with Boris Johnson again, this time in London to sign a free trade agreement. Well, kind of, it's an agreement for a free trade agreement. Prime Minister Scott Morrison and his British counterpart have this evening signed off on the broad terms of a free trade agreement. Prime Ministers Boris Johnson and Scott Morrison signing off on an in-principle agreement for a free trade deal between the two countries to be completed by the end of the year. Yes, and it turns out many in Labor here are in favour of the UK free trade deal. Uh, all the backbenchers want to see if they can swap Anthony Albanese for UK Labor leader Keir Starmer. Yes, Keir Starmer jokes. That's what you come to news fighters for. Everyone loves Keir Starmer jokes. So then how was this a historic trade deal between a former coloniser and its colony sealed with a antique fountain pen signing ceremony on board a replica of the HMS Endeavour with a trading of flags or a handing back of stolen Indigenous artefacts from the British Museum? <laughs> nope. This was the moment the two leaders delivered the news overnight, standing shoulder to shoulder and exchanging biscuits. You give us Tim Tams, we give you, we give you penguins, uh, uh, you give us Vegemite, we give you Marmite. They swapped their little jars of Vegemite and Marmite yesterday, mm. so it's all happening. Do you Tim think Tams, of course. <laughs> I didn't understand what we were getting back from Tim Tams. What are penguins? I'm not familiar with penguins either. Sounds like Australia got ripped off in that exchange, don't you think? <laughs> They're not as good as a Tim Tams. Yes, it was in fact the greatest biscuit-based diplomacy since the famous ginger nuts. 
at the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. So what do we get out of the deal? Well, aside from a packet of penguins. The new deal will eventually deliver cheaper British cars, scotch whiskey and biscuits. Australian lamb, beef and sugar are likely to be exported into Britain in greater volumes and winemakers are also a winner with tariffs cut. Under the deal, tariffs on other Australian agricultural exports like dairy and sugar will be slowly phased out. Lamb and beef products will be tariff free in 15 years. Yes, Australian meat producers have 15 years. Till I have unrestricted tariff-free imports into the UK. Guys, I don't think meat lasts that long. I had a packet of mince turned brown in my fridge in a week once. 15 years, you might want to freeze some of that beef. And the deal also includes some immigration and visa changes for when borders reopen to travellers in... I don't know, 2035 probably. It'll see restrictions on working visas relaxed, with the age limit on working holiday visas increased to 35. Other changes include British backpackers being able to stay longer down under without having to work on farms. Yes, great news there for eternally developmentally arrested Aussies and Brits who can now put off getting their lives together and keep backpacking till they're 35. And with Brits no longer on our farms whinging about getting sunburnt picking our fruits and vegetables for less than the minimum wage, we could be facing labour shortages. But wait, there's a plan. The Nationals say they've done a deal to establish a new agriculture visa to replace backpackers lost under the free trade agreement with the UK. The visa would allow citizens from countries including Indonesia, the Philippines and Singapore to work in Australia for up to three years. Yes, the coalition stopped the boats, but now they need to start the planes to pick the fruit, the goats to cotties to make the cordial that I like best. Oh, hey, government, if you're looking for some uh, dedicated agriculture workers, I did hear about this uh, great Sri Lankan family that used to have a job at a Queensland abattoir that they're keen to get back to. Maybe you could, uh, maybe you could work on that. Anyway, Scott Morrison's Euro trip didn't stop there. He also swung by France so the journalists could use the few French words they remember from school. And he wasn't quite ready to say au revoir to Europe, ducking across to Paris to say bonjour to President Macron. Yes, and the Prime Minister also said, s'il vous plaît and merci beaucoup before they shared an entree of plat du jour. Comme si, comme ça, où est la bibliothèque? And finally, Scott Morrison made sure he made time to stop in and visit an old friend or just the only guy he knew in Paris who could translate a room service menu for him. And there was time for just a brief meeting with the now head of the OECD, former finance minister Matthias Cormann. Hey Matthias, remember when we uh, flew you around the world in our private jet for months at taxpayers' expense so you could lobby to get this job while thousands of Australians were stuck uh, stranded overseas? (laughs) Uh, Good times. Okay, so ScoMo European vacation done. What next? The Prime Minister will return to two weeks quarantine in the lodge. Two weeks? That's going to need a few packets of... Tim Tams, of course.